came across um, a certain term from the book, Tsunami Taka. Ha! <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's it's when I, that, that was my first experience of leading change. And I had to bring the numbers down from 120 mm. to 60. <laughs> so I had to let go of a lot of people. Yep. And, and yet some of those, it was so interesting. I, I met somebody who I had to let go during that time, 12 years later. And the way he greeted me and the way he was so warm with me, I thought, oh my gosh, I think I did do something right. Huh? Mm. but it was tough it, it was I was not liked very much during that time so that's something you also learn you have to do it with care and respect even as you are parting ways with people huh? and, and Daniel I, I do see the question in the chat from Alice should I take that yes. one quickly she yes says, oh my gosh very powerful very powerful insights I would like to ask Madam Taka if she had any challenges moving from one career path to the other Oh, most certainly. Oh, even uh, the way I describe it, please let nobody think it was like some nice linear path like this. Eh? It has been more like, like this, up and down. And, and I think one of the big challenges, for instance, when I, when I knew I wanted to move to leadership, I had no credentials to do mm. leadership work. Eh? So it actually took me a while to go get my organizational development certification, my coaching certification, before I had the confidence to say now I have the skills and tools. So my first challenge as I would move around, it was the same thing when I was moving from law to human rights. I was like, I've been a corporate lawyer. Do I know enough about human rights? When I was moving from human rights to women's rights, I was like, oh. so there was always a period where there was a steep learning curve and a lack of confidence that I had to work on. Huh? So one of the things I had to remind myself during those times, I'm like, this too will pass. Huh? It's always like this in the beginning. This doesn't mean that you are not meant to do it. It just means you're clumsy. Hmm? So with all humility, I would say, I'm just willing to learn. I know right now I may not do it so smoothly because it's my first time doing it. And I was always willing, therefore, to be outside of my comfort zone. So, so yes, indeed, it, was, it wasn't always easy. And yes, Aaron, 100%. <laughs> I would say to Aaron, 100%, not just my father's, huh? <laughs> but also <laughs> my mother's, both of them. My, and I think many of you can see my, my dad behind me. That's the photo behind me is my dad. He passed last year. So his light still holds very strong for me, but for sure it has influenced my career growth and prospects to a large degree. Except I'm not going into politics. Yes, I'm not going into politics. So that one, I would not follow him. <laughs> so, so this was daddy representing Harvard? Yes, that's the age. Um, and he eventually went to the Olympics. In, at, in Tokyo, <laughs> he didn't get a medal, <laughs> but that was him getting ready. Ah, no, Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> so, in in leadership, Madam Taka has gone through a lot and now settled on leadership, and it's it's always about the passion leading and and having that deep knowing that this is what you are called to do so at a point in time there is a change or there's a shift and it's it's all about having that deep knowing that this is what you are called to do and so when you make the change or shift you make peace with yourself you don't put your yourself down and and then you also have a sense of joy and you also want to check that you are matching your gifts the, the gifts that god blessed you with placing you on this, this uh, planet and on this continent that you have the opportunity to serve others with your gifts. So it's, it's basically about service, your willingness also then to surrender to God and allow God to use you and the gifts that he's putting you so that others will, will, will benefit. And um, so what, what are you bringing? What, what contribution are you making in whatever space, whether it's in the family or in the corporate space or politics or whatever space that you find yourself? It's always about what are you contributing? What are you bringing 
on board. And for Africa, I mean, this, this woman has a deep passion for change and development on the continent of Africa. And, and you can tell the number of things she's done, five careers already. And she says for Africa, the kind of leadership that we need is the leadership or the kind of leaders who are self-aware, who are empowering, who are uh, pursue transformative agenda, who are inclusive, who are bold, who are courageous. And we, we need to develop these. And he, she took time in, in breaking these down and packing them for us. And we also talked about her book. She has a book, Leadership in Africa, Redefined Untold Stories. And uh, three reasons why she wrote this particular book. We have a lot out there. But the first thing is that the narrative is not positive when it comes to Africa. And so we hear stories of negative leadership examples. So there are untold stories. We have so many examples. And so Taka did so well by capturing them. Um, she interviewed 30 different individuals across the continent of Africa. It's, uh, women, men, young, old different sectors and different areas. And it's all to bring to the fore um, the positives that we have, the best of us, not just the worst of us that we hear so much about. And also to situate the leadership discussion in, in the African context. That is the second reason for the book. And, and so that we can relate to it. Leadership is situational. The third thing is to provide resource. Uh, I was blessed. I was part of the launch. I was part of the select few that were there. And I remember the professor who did the book review saying that he's already adding the book to <laughs> the materials that his students uh, use. Prof. Atugba was saying that. Professor Raymond Atugba was saying that. So to provide resource. And at least at the launch, we had a testament to that, that that is already being achieved. And there is, there is material avail available, African context. It seems I'm, I'm sharing a lot. Let me pause here. <laughs> if you want the book, there are places you can get that. Airport Shell is available at Airport Shell. Vidya Bookshop, and that is located in Osu or Laboni. You can also get a copy on, at the Blue Light Night, that is at Melco. And then you can get it on Amazon. You, you don't need to go too far. Go to takaawari.com. Takaawari, T-A-A-K-A-A-W-O-R-I.com. And once you get on a website, you have the opportunity to connect and get. Yeah, someone saw me reading the book at a, a, a bus station. I was waiting for my bus. I was waiting for STC bus. And the person came to ask me, how do I get a copy of this book? And I, I told him point blank, I know oh, the one wow. who wrote the book. Oh. Wow. And you should get it. So I gave I gave him a number, and then I told him the name to call. I gave the number as Lydia, and he should call. And just when he was leaving, I told him, "Look, if you don't call, I will know because the number <laughs> of you is the number it's of my wife." Of my wife. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, so um, I, I should have given this disclaimer at the beginning. I have the, uh, the soft spots. <laughs> For this woman, I mean, she's my wife's <laughs> boss, and she is my boss. I'm an associate <laughs> trainer with Busara Africa. She's giving me opportunities that I would not have stumbled upon, but for what uh, she did and in creating that space. I mean, there are spaces she's created for me that I wasn't even confident myself to enter. And this woman will empower you and inject that sense of confidence <laughs> into you. Our Taka, okay. there are questions or? Yes, I've seen them. anything? It starts with um, Aaron is asking me about how I would compare 
um, Ugandan experience to that of Ghana. I would say we're very similar countries culturally. Yeah? I find countries that have royalty, yeah? and we also have some of our ethnic groups also have royalty here. Yeah? So, mm. so lots of, we're all both similar warm people. So, so quite similar. Um, Emmanuel asked a tough question, um, but, but Emmanuel, I would say there's four things you could do. Huh? Um, if you've moved into a leadership position of a team that's experiencing turbulence, huh? uh, four things. Number one, huh? it's, it's to understand what is causing the turbulence around performance perspectives. You can always see, I always say, before you move to act, understand your terrain. Huh? So number one, understand what is causing this poor performance. Huh? Number two, clarify expectations. I find that there's an issue around not hitting targets, not performing. You've got to get back to crown and granule about what are those targets people are supposed to, to meet. Huh? Then number three, it's like once you've clarified your expectations and your expectations, not just in terms of what they're supposed to achieve, but how, the attitude, the third thing then is coach, build capacity, mentor them to deliver that. So if you're going to set a bar for people and say, this is the bar, make sure they're able to achieve that. And once you, you know you have done everything in your power to help them achieve that, if they don't, and this is the part we always struggle with, we have to be ready to hold them accountable. Too often when I see there's issues around performance is somewhere, somewhere down the line as leaders, we've not held people accountable because at least I find that that is one of the toughest roles in leadership, holding high flyers, high performers accountable that you don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything. They'll, they'll hold themselves accountable. It's those who are struggling where there's turbulence. That's the tough one. It means you have to learn how to have difficult conversations. You may have to learn how to give people queries. You may have to learn how to finally tell people, I'm sorry, you're not a match. Right. So I would, those would be the four. Yeah, I would say those would be the, the four steps. I hope that's useful. There's Imagine. another one about managing resistance. I didn't, I, I, I looked at that question. I wasn't sure what Alexander meant. Unless you understand it, Daniel. I don't so know if in you your leadership, agree. if you encounter resistance, maybe the people you are leading, the team you are working with, there is resistance from their, their part. But he called it leadership resistance. That's why yeah. I wasn't sure. I thought, yeah, because I understand the I, regular resistance, but I thought, is it? Hmm? I was, that's yeah, why I wanted. Yeah, hello. Yes, Alex. Alex. Yes, I wanted to make a clarification on the question. Yes. Okay. yes, it has to do with, uh, you know, in Africa, more, most often, uh, we have what you call, when did you come? We are appointed hey. as a leader. To... <laughs> yes, so that was the question, what that meant. You, you have been appointed to be a leader or, of, a, of a group or an organization, and people who have been in the place for long want the to Mahaches, The MBAs. Sure, sure, ah. sure, sure. So how do you handle those groups? Okay. 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 Nice. Thank you for clarifying that. And, and I, the reason I know that term is because I faced those. Huh? When I joined ActionAid, I, I found people who'd been there 15 years and were even older than me. And they said, what do you know? You've been a foreigner, small guy. Small guy, who are you coming to tell us what to do? Huh? We have been here, we know. Huh? And, and I think there was a couple of things I used, strategies I used that helped. One was humility. Hmm? Number two, I was willing to listen to them. So I didn't go in with all my, huh? And, and number three, I found ways to make them feel valued. So rather than pushing them aside and working around them, because what I find is that behavior comes from insecurity. People are finding ways to still be relevant. <laughs> That's why they are now saying, we are busy, what do you know? Huh? And so then, oh, Daniel, I hope you've not lost power. <laughs> So then to me, the key thing would be then saying, all right, so you've been here. How can we build on your knowledge? How can I bring you on board? Huh? But at the same time, I will let them know. There's almost always a limit. I'll say at the same time, if you're not willing to get with the program, then we'll have to part ways. I won't keep pandering to you forever. So, but I know it's not an easy one, but it's to, it's to start by being really willing to listen to them and say, Okay, give me all this knowledge, this institutional knowledge. 
from the time you have been here. See, Mariam is asking me, how did you identify your coach? Ah, through the network. Huh? At that time, it was through my network. Now it's much easier for, because for example, we have an association of coaches in Ghana with a website. So if I was today, I would have gone onto the website huh, to look for my coach. Um, the, the impact he had on my life was, on my leadership role was amazing because what he did was deepen my self-awareness. Huh? So I had a deeper understanding of my leadership role simply because, it's not because he gave me advice, but he asked me very powerful questions that allowed me to understand better what I was doing well and what I was not doing well at all that I needed to shift. Huh? So I hope that answers your question, Mariam. And Joseph, what are the qualities of a good leader? At which stage does one become a leader? So, so Joseph, I don't know if you were here earlier. I think I said some of the qualities of a, of a good leader and particularly the type that are needed on this continent are they're self-aware, they're empowering, they're transformative, they're bold, they're courageous. They're, uh, one of the things I would also add is they're people of integrity. If I haven't said that before, I should really emphasize that, that integrity is so fundamental. Huh? And, and Joseph, the one thing I'll say about what, what stage does one become a leader? The minute you are born, you become a leader. And the reason is my key leadership ethos is that you don't need a position to be a leader. So don't wait for somebody to put on a title, bestow you with a title of director, supervisor, manager to be a leader. All of us have an opportunity to exercise leadership in our little corners, whether we have a title or not. Huh? So, so Joseph, please don't wait. Huh? Start exercising leadership right now. If you see a problem that needs to be fixed, to be addressed, you have a vision you want to realize, mobilize people. What is leadership? It's mobilizing people around a shared goal. That's all it is. And many times you don't actually have, and you don't always need to lead from the front. You can lead from the side, from the back, they're all different directions. Huh? So, so, so don't wait. There's no particular stage that you become a leader. I have a question to ask. Yes. Yeah, as a woman, I, looking at it, it's like you have worked with a whole lot of organizations. And being yes. a woman, how were you able to work with the men? You know, I'm saying this because, you know, sometimes um, I'm not looking down upon any man. But I'm trying to say that, you know, as a woman, especially being in that particular, you know, level, being a senior person in an organization, how were you able to work well with the men in that mm. particular? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the question, huh, Mariam. I, you know, one of the things I've always believed in is, is I recognize that particularly if I'm a woman and there are few women eh, and, and there are few women leaders, I recognize that it's not just about me. I'm representing many other women because if I, if I mess up, they'll say, ah, you see, women can't do this job. So I, I, I seek for excellence because I know I, I'm representing my entire gender in some respects. Eh? Um, and then I treat people equitably, just the way I want to be treated. Eh? So Mariam, I don't treat somebody and say, ah, you just do that because you're a man. Or, duh, duh, duh. So I take you as a person. I'll take you as John. I'll take you as Aaron. I'll take you as Joseph, not just because you're a man. But if there are certain ways you, you, you do things because of your particular gender, then I seek to understand. And I appreciate the differences. We don't all have to be exactly the same. I think diversity is a strength. Huh? What I won't tolerate is sexism. I'll call you out. So if you make a comment that is just derogatory of, 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 of women, I will call you out and I will speak about it. And, and I will say that is that I do not tolerate. So I see a key part of my role as a woman leader is creating a space where all people feel comfortable, particularly those who have generally, like women, may not have fe felt as comfortable. And being particularly empowering of women and creating opportunities 
for women in a way that doesn't make the men therefore feel, oh, now she's only coming to promote women and leave out the men so that the men don't feel threatened. Thank you very much. Maria, my husband, yeah? Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it's okay, but I just want to find out from you. So working in a male-dominated organization, what are some of the key, you know, um, key and very prominent things that can guide you when you are working with a male dominated area? You know, sometimes one of the things, Mariam, is, is, is excellence, huh? Because what you may find, Mariam, is in a male dominated area, they're almost expecting that you as a woman will do less with less quality. So I think one of the things that helped me was a commitment to excellence. So that people wouldn't think I'm second best or I was just there because I'm a woman. So I would think that is one of the things that has really helped me. And always there will be a group who will say, oh, you can't do this because of, and they'll put a box around you. And then you will find one person who's willing to give you the opportunity Though that's where I focus. I seize that opportunity. So actually the rest who are trying to limit me, because for me, I've been, ha I've had people who tried to limit me either because I'm black or because I'm a woman or because I'm a foreigner. Huh? And all I do is I close my ears like this. And I said, me, I know where I'm going. I'm not letting anybody, I know who is with me. And I move forward because all I need is one person to open that door for me. And then I move forward. And when I'm in that door, as soon as somebody gives me the opportunity, I do my very best so that all of those who are saying before she can't do it, she can't do it, they're like, hmm, maybe actually we should keep quiet because we can actually see she can do it. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Question, though. Thank you, Marianne. Awesome. Thank you very much. So at this juncture, we asked for one hour. We've crossed one hour already. We are inching close to an extra 30 minutes. I want to appreciate you Taka very much for, for making time to, to be with us, to come on this platform and to share your world of knowledge with us. It's, it's been an old school. It's, <laughs> of course, that's what you Thank do. You. So <laughs> that's what you do. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And, you. and friends, thank you for the questions that you've put across. Yes. Yeah, gone a long way to enrich the discussion. And we thank you all for, for coming. And um, we can only pray for the best for all of us on our leadership journey and the kind of leadership that we want to see on the continent of Africa, in the spaces where we work, in our family, at our workplaces, in our communities, churches, and uh, mosques, and all the places that we find ourselves. Um, let's, let's show great leadership. Let's, let's show for this kind of leadership that Africa needs. Let's uh, show examples that are not negative of us, but the very best of us to, to the rest of the world. Uh, the black man is capable of managing uh, his own affairs. Let, let's make that one work. Let's, let's see more of that. And for Taka, we thank you so much for what you've shared with us. Thank we you. pray for you. Uh, that God continues to bless you and bless Amen. the work that you are doing and increase Thank the impact you. and the influence that you have and, and let it reach your generations just like the legacy that he has left you will also make your mark uh, oh, on, on thank you so much you I was honored and humbled to have been here thank you so much Yes, thank you. So some of you, I, I saw some questions. I have to pretend I've not seen them because of the time. I'm sure we'll get another opportunity and then we will talk more. But Taka, um, forgive me, I had done my closing remarks. <laughs> then I remember there's a question that is on my heart. So if people want to connect with Busara, they want to benefit from leadership training. They they want coaching. They want to be helped. How, how can they get access? Okay. I know they can well, contact me, but apart from contacting me. 
So you can reach us on our website. I've just put the website in the chat. So bosara-africa.com. Um, but you can also connect with me on social media, particularly LinkedIn. Huh? I am not, I don't go onto Facebook every day. I, forgive me on that, but LinkedIn, I check regularly. So either get on our website um, or connect with me on LinkedIn with my name, Taka Awori. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And Thank I can you only so say much for having at this me. Juncture. Okay. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>